can lead off with, with Job, um, which teaches us about suffering and the sovereignty of God. I remember when I went to Haiti five, five or six years ago now, I was there uh, to speak as a part of a pastor's conference, speaking to uh, Haitian pastors, Haitian leaders, and our topic was the sovereignty of God and suffering. And we found out in the course of our days there that these people had been uh, bullied by charismatic health and wealth, prosperity gospel, name it, claim it types who came in from the States to tell them, now imagine saying this to a people who'd experienced a devastating earth earthquake a year before, to tell them that, that God didn't intend for his people to suffer. God didn't intend for his people to be in me. Imagine if someone going and telling the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere those things. And then they had also beating them about the head the voodoo practitioners who told them that they were suffering uh, because, because they were not being uh, followers of the, of the true gods. But they were suffering because the voodoo practitioners were, were casting spells on them. And we came in, opening the scriptures to them, teaching about how God is sovereign in all of life, even in our sufferings. And I will, I will never forget the weeping, the Q&A time, when they would say through interpreters, we, we thought God had abandoned us. And yet you're telling us that he still loves us, even in the earthquakes even in the hurricanes, even in the poverty, and he still loves us. So this is a critical topic. And this book addresses it in an amazing way. It doesn't give the answer that Job wants. We're going to look at that a little bit. But it does declare something that puts us right square in the face are we going to believe God and his word or are we not and in his word are we going to find comfort rather than finding comfort in our circumstances so let's look at this uh, tonight I want us to uh, I'm gonna, I want you to just stand with me I want to read a couple of verses you'll see them again and then we're going to did I Michelle did I send the link to the Job material and read scripture I intended to you have it? Michelle's always ahead of me. <laughs> always. What a blessing that is. Let's read this. I'll just follow along. Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, I will hope in him again. Yet I will argue my ways to his face. When I'm reading that, I, Michelle, when we finish tonight, remind me, would you, would you pull up sometime this evening a song by Shane and Shane? entitled Though He Slay Me, and it's got a section, a little interlude in there where John Piper is speaking. If you can find that, it's Shane and Shane, Though He Slay Me, is the title of the song, and it's got a little section where John Piper is speaking through an interlude section. Remind me, we won't play that at the conclusion. But yeah. Stay closer? Okay, I thought I was vibrating a little bit. Thank you. All right. Job 13, 15, though he slay me, I will hope in him again, yet I will argue my ways to his face. And then Job 37, 23, 24, the Almighty, we cannot find him. He is great in power, justice, and abundant righteousness he will not violate. Therefore, men fear him. He does not regard any who are wise in their own conceit. What have we just read together? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And now I want us to see, it's about, I think it's about an 11-minute intro from the folks that read Scripture, but it's well worth uh, every minute. They do a tremendous job of giving an overview of Job. I might pronounce things a little differently than they do in some areas, but I'm telling you, they hit the nail on the head. So thank you. Be seated. Let's watch this video. <laughs> 
The book of Job, it's a profound and very unique book in the Bible for lots of reasons. The story is set in a very obscure land that's far away from Israel, Uz. The main character, Job, he's not even an Israelite. And the author, who's anonymous, doesn't even set the story in any clear period of ancient history. This all seems intentional, though. It's like the author doesn't want us to be distracted by historical questions, but rather to focus simply on the story of Job and on the questions raised by his experience of suffering. The book of Job has a very clear literary design. It opens and closes with a short narrative prologue and then an epilogue. And then the central body of the book is dense Hebrew poetry, representing conversations between Job and four dialogue partners called the Friends. These conversations are then concluded by a series of poetic speeches given by God to Job. Let's dive in and we'll just see how it works together. The prologue introduces us to Job and we're told that he's a blameless, upright man who honors God. He's a super good guy. And then all of a sudden, we're transported into the heavenly realms, and God is holding court with his staff team. It's a very common image in the Old Testament describing how God runs the world. And among the heavenly beings is a figure called the Satan, which in Hebrew means the accuser or the prosecutor. And it's like we're watching a court scene. God presents Job as a truly righteous man. And then the accuser challenges God's policy of rewarding righteous people like Job. He says, the only reason Job obeys you is because you bless him with prosperity. Let Job suffer. Then we'll see how righteous he actually is. And then God agrees to let the accuser inflict suffering on Job. Now, it's at this point in the story that most of us go, what? Why did God do that? And then we assume that this book is going to answer that question, why God allows good people to suffer. But as you read on, the book doesn't answer that question. Nothing in the book ever answers that question. The prologue is setting up the real questions this book is trying to get at. Questions about God's justice and whether God operates the universe according to the strict principle of justice. And the response to those questions comes as you read through to the end of the book, not at the beginning. The ultimate reason for Job's suffering is simply never revealed. So the prologue concludes with a suffering and bewildered Job who's rebuked by his wife and he's approached by three friends who are going to try and provide wisdom and counsel. Their names are Eliphaz, the Tamanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Naamathite. They're all non-Israelites like Job. And they represent the best of ancient Near Eastern thinking about God and suffering and the human condition. And this moves us into the main part of the book. First, Job speaks. And this is how the section of the book works. First, Job is going to speak, and then they'll follow a response from a friend. Then Job will respond to that friend. Then another friend will respond to Job's response, and so on, back and forth, for three cycles. And this whole debate is focused on three questions. Is God truly just in character? And does God run the universe on the strict principle of justice? And if so, then how is Job's suffering to be explained? As we're going to see, Job and the friends, they're working from a huge assumption about what God's justice ought to look like in the world. Namely, that every single thing that happens in the universe should operate according to the strict principle of justice. So if you're a wise, good person and you honor God, good things will happen to you. God will reward you. But if you're evil and stupid and do sinful things, bad things will happen to you. God will punish you. Now, Job's constant argument throughout his speeches is this. First of all, that he's innocent. And so the implication of that is that his suffering is not a divine punishment. Now, we know from the prologue, both of these things are true. Remember, God himself said, Job is righteous and blameless. And so Job concludes his argument by accusing God. God either doesn't run the world according to justice or even worse, God himself is simply unjust. The friends, on the other hand, they beg to differ. Their argument is that God is just. The implication being that God always runs the world according to justice in this way. And so they conclude by accusing not God, but Job. Job must have done something really, really bad for God to punish him like this. They even start making up possible sins that Job must have committed. Job protests to all of this. In fact, he gets so fed up with the friends that he eventually just gives up on them. He takes up his case directly with God. 
Now, something to be aware of is that Job, he's on an emotional roller coaster in these poems. He used to think that God is just, but now he can't reconcile that with his suffering. And so in some outbursts, Job, he'll accuse God of being a bully. Once he even declares that God has orchestrated all the injustice in the world. But the moment he utters that thought, he's terrified of it because he wants to hope and believe that God is truly just. Job is all over the place in this section. And so he makes one last statement of his innocence, and then he demands that God show up personally to explain himself. Now, it's at this point that a surprise friend shows up, Elihu the Buzite. Now, he's not an Israelite, but he does have a Hebrew name. And Elihu, he has the same assumption as Job and the friends. He argues that God is just and that that implies that God always operates the universe according to justice. But then Elihu draws a more sophisticated conclusion about why good people suffer. It may not be punishment for sin in the past. God might inflict suffering as a warning to help people avoid sin in the future. Or God might use pain and suffering to build character or to teach people valuable lessons. Elihu doesn't claim to know why Job is suffering, but one thing he is certain of, Job is wrong to accuse God of being unjust. Job doesn't even respond to Elihu and the dialogues come to a close. It's like the wisdom of the ancients has been spent and the mystery remains. And then, all of a sudden, God shows up in a whirlwind, and he responds to Job personally. He first responds to Job's accusation that he's unjust and incompetent at running the universe. So God takes Job on a virtual tour of the universe, and he starts asking him all these questions about the order and origins of the cosmos. Was Job ever around when God architected the earth or organized the constellations? Has Job ever commanded the sunrise or controlled the weather? God has his eyes on all of these cosmic details that Job has never even conceived of. Then God starts going into detail, describing the grazing habits of mountain goats and how deer give birth or the feeding pattern of lions and wild donkeys. What's the point of all this? Remember the assumption of Job and his friends about what it looks like for God to run the world according to justice. Underneath that assumption is a deeper one, that Job and his friends have a wide enough perspective on life to make such a claim about how God ought to run the world. And God's response with this virtual tour, it deconstructs all of these assumptions. It first of all shows that the universe is a vast, complex place and that God has his eyes on all of it, every detail. Job, on the other hand, has only the small horizon of his life experience to draw from. His view of the world is very limited. And so what looks like divine injustice, from Job's point of view, needs to be seen in an infinitely larger context. Job is simply not in a position to make such a huge accusation about God. After the virtual tour, God asks Job if he would like to micromanage the world for a day according to the strict principle of justice that Job and his friends assume, punishing every evil deed of every person at every moment with precise retribution. The fact is that carrying out justice in a world like ours, it's extremely complex. It's never black and white like Job and the friends seem to think, which leads to God's last point. He starts describing these two fantastic creatures, Behemoth and Leviathan, which some people think are poetic depictions of a hippo and a crocodile. But more likely, they refer to well-known creatures from ancient Near Eastern mythology that are used elsewhere in the Bible as symbols of the disorder and danger that exist in God's good world. These creatures, they're not evil. God's actually quite proud of them, but they're not safe either. The point is that God's world is amazing and very good, but it's not perfect or always safe. God's world has order and beauty, but it's also wild and sometimes dangerous, just like these two fantastic creatures. And so we come back to the big question of Job's suffering. Why is there suffering in God's world? Whether it's from earthquakes or wild animals or from other humans, God doesn't explain why. What he says is that we live in an extremely complex, amazing world that at this stage, at least, is not designed to prevent suffering. And that's God's response. Job challenged God's justice. God responds that Job doesn't have sufficient knowledge about our universe to make such a claim. Job demanded a full explanation from God. And what God asked Job for is trust in his wisdom and character. And so Job responds with humility and repentance. He apologizes for accusing God and he acknowledges that he's overstepped his bounds. Then all of a sudden the book concludes with a short epilogue. 
First, God says that the friends were wrong, that their ideas about God's justice were just too simple, not true to the complexity of the world or God's wisdom. And then God says that Job has spoken rightly about him. Now, this is surprising because it can't apply to everything Job said. I mean, we know Job drew hasty and wrong conclusions, but God still approves of Job's wrestling, how Job came honestly before God with all of his emotion and pain and simply wanted to talk to God himself. And God says that's the right way to process through all of this, through the struggle of prayer. The book concludes with Job having his health, his family, his wealth all restored, not as a reward for good behavior, but simply as a generous gift from God. And that's the end of the book. So the book of Job, it doesn't unlock the puzzle of why bad things happen to good people. Rather, it does invite us to trust God's wisdom when we do encounter suffering, rather than try and figure out the reasons for it. When we search for reasons, we tend to either simplify God like the friends, or like Job, accuse God, but based on limited evidence. And so the book is inviting us to honestly bring our pain and our grief to God and to trust that God actually cares and that he knows what he's doing. And that's what the book of Job is all about. So there you have it. There's, I'm thinking about some, some studies that people have done for, in Job through the years and some remarkable sayings and some uh, hymns, old hymns have come out of it. You may have seen the saying, if you cannot see his hand, trust his heart. And then there's an old hymn, it's one of my, one of my favorites, uh, when it walks through the difficulties of life and it, the refrain is, uh, he's too wise to be mistaken, too good to be unkind, and you, and that's how you're to see life. And so that's what basically the book of Job, in manifesting the sovereign prerogative of God in all of life, finally shouts out to us, trust me. Don't try to figure me out. Don't second guess me. Trust me. So, so with that in mind, thank you so much, Michelle, for showing that. Let's think about Job for the next little, little while. It begins, the story begins, if you're familiar with it, begins in heaven with a conversation between God and Satan, which is, should cause you to stop and think, what in the world is going on here? He comes into the, to the chambers of what we recognize as heaven, and God does not say, what in the world are you doing here? How dare you come in here? I cast you out. He comes into those chambers, and God says, what you been doing? His answer is, well, I've been wandering to and fro. Basically, the implication being sizing up. And the way he says what he says, God responds, have you considered my servant, Job? And so this, this heavenly scene where God has a controversy with Satan, we're going to see that in the outline in a moment, uh, goes all the way where we come back to earth, the bigger portion of the book, and then the, the book ends uh, with a heaven and earth encounter between God and Job. Uh, this is a look, uh, a detailed look at the life of an ancient patriarch. And if you know it, you know that overnight Job goes from being a, a man who, in the eyes of the world, has it all, a man who... Uh, is very uh, religious. He, he sacrifices on behalf of his children with the thinking that if, if perhaps they have sinned in their conduct and their activity, I want to come before God as an intercessor, as a, as a priest before God on behalf of my family. And overnight, the runners begin to come in. I've just come from the field and this tragedy has occurred and I, only I am left and Come to the field, your, your livestock have all been slaughtered. I, only I am left. I've come from the field, your, your grains have been destroyed. Only I survive. And everything changes. And he does what you and I have done, probably will do again, when difficult providences come at us, particularly when they come in waves, seemingly. And that is why. Why? 
As we learned in the video, he has four uh, friends who come to him. Now, let's, let's give them credit. Uh, apparently, only four friends came to him. <laughs> we tend to focus on what they had to say, but let's give them credit. They did come to him. In fact, they sit, three of them sit with him uh, for a week just in silent support in his suffering. Uh, his, his wife... Uh, Someone has, somewhere at writer has said, he said the only, the only person God left alive in his family is the one who tells him, why don't you curse God and die? God's clearly got it in for you. Go ahead and f finish it out. So he tells her she doesn't understand what's going on. But what's happening is that God is working behind the scenes. The name Shaddai occurs uh, several times in this book. 30-something times. I believe it only occurs 17 times in the rest of the Old Testament. Uh, it is the Lord God Almighty. Uh, he is, uh, so the emphasis on God's power, his sovereignty, his prerogative. And the book calls us to this need to trust the Lord completely when we cannot see his hand, trust his heart. Uh, look at, uh, with me if you would, at Job 32, 1, a couple of verses here tell us about how Job, who begins in something of a manifestation of humility, uh, takes on a, uh, a complaining spirit, a grumbling spirit. And he grows in this sense of self-righteousness. Job 32, 1, so the three men, these three friends of his, ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. He uh, every time they would propose something, he became more indignant concerning his, his innocence. Job 40, verse 8. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condone me that you might be in the right? That voice out of the whirlwind. So he moves from humility to indignation, but thankfully he comes uh, to repentance in the end, and that's that's what's critical. So, so we're going to see these three uh, sections of Job. There's first of all the dilemma of Job. That's covered in chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 13. This is the portion that takes place in heaven and earth where the, where, uh, the devil comes into the courts of God. There's a controversy in this section between God and Satan. And so the dilemma is set. The tragedy has occurred. He is, he is reduced to sackcloth and ashes. John Piper does a, a brilliant uh, job. If you don't know a whole lot about the ministry of John Piper, he loves to write poetry. Sometimes it's rhyming poetry. Sometimes it's, it's prose. Uh, but he has a great uh, uh, prose story based upon Job. And he points out something uh, that I don't know until I'd read that, that I... That that all this is happening, and Job really doesn't ever understand early on in the book why it's happening. And uh, Piper uses this image, and this, this dark cloud appears, and Job's wondering, what, what does this mean? What is going on? Uh, but he really tells a great story. I think he gives a good perspective on this. We think that this, uh, this took place. This, we're going to see this a little more when we look at author and they said, perhaps in 2000 B.C., there is just a lot not given to help us nail down authorship. There's a lot of suggestions as to who may have written it. Uh, well, we don't know. Maybe 2000 B.C., during the period what we, we recognize as the patriarchs, when, when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when they lived. So the second thing you see is these debates that go on in Job in chapters, uh, chapter 3, verse 1 to 37, 24. Uh, this takes place on earth in, in Uz. Uh, Uz would be a land in, in northern Arabia. It would, it would be near to Midian, uh, which plays a role in people considering that perhaps Moses wrote this uh, because he was, he was in Midian at the time that we think this, was, this occurred. By using uh, prose and poetry, we get this movement through these, and, and, and the video mentioned this. There's, this. there's this first cycle of the debate that takes place in chapter 3, 1 to 
14, 22, and then, then they cycle back around again. Each time, the, the friends are coming up with different ways to, to say to Job, man, you've, you've sinned. I mean, don't you, don't you see what this is all about? Just, just confess your sin. Just find out how you, how you offended God. Clearly, he's offended with you. And this, this moves uh, through the second cycle, third cycle. Then there's this, Job gives this, this final defense, and that's when he, when he basically begins to demand, I want to talk to God face to face. I, I need some answers from him. And so you see just how, how far his, his arrogance has taken him. And then this, this fellow Elihu shows up and, and gives a little different take uh, on Job's problems uh, than his friends had. He doesn't necessarily tie it to, to Job's problems past sinfulness, to, to conduct that has, has stirred God to act in it with such, a, such a, a, a difficult set of providences. So Elihu brings his word. We're going we're to compare these friends here in a few minutes. Then there's the deliverance of Job that takes place in 38, 1 through 42, 17. Now the, the stage shifts. Remember now, after God has basically told Satan... Go and test Job. Satan responds, oh, how can I test Job? You give him everything. He's, he's got everything a man could want. He's got a big family. He's got wealth. He's got power. He's got privilege. God says, take it away. And there's this, uh, what I've said through the years in studying Job is, you don't know Job like I know Job. And so the devil does. God says, take it away. Just don't touch him. So he removes his blessings in this wave of difficulties that come and comes back. And the Scripture tells us, we're going to see this, that Job did not initially accuse God, curse God, did not sin with his mouth. The devil says, well, a man cares for his flesh more than he cares for his things. God says, touch him then. Just don't kill him. So the, the boils come on him, and all the all the painful physical experiences, and so we're gonna we want to see the how this unfolds. He does not look at the beginning of the book like someone that you would think disaster would come upon. Look at Job one one. We're gonna just see how it opens up. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Let me say something about. Uh, Job loses his way in the course of this book, very much like David lost his way. Uh, but David was considered a man after God's own heart, and God did not take that back, ever. And so we see this, this picture when, when God commends Job in the end. Uh, this is, this is what, what marks him out. He does lose his way in the heaviness of, uh, of the trials, but this is who he is. In Job 1.8, the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth, blameless and upright. He fears God, turns away from evil, and that's what sets this whole a tragedy in motion. And we, you heard in the video that Satan or, or Satan uh, means accuser. And he's called in the scripture the accuser of the brethren. He comes to, uh, and here's what he does, just, just parenthetically let me say. He will accuse you. In your sin, he will point out to you your inadequacies, your, uh, your inconsistencies, your failures, your besetting sins. He will accuse you as if to say that you're a hypocrite. You have no reason to believe that, that you have a meaningful relationship with God. He will also accuse God to you, that God is not a good God. We're going to look at the end of this at something called theodicy. The Odyssey is T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y. It's from, from two words, theos, dikaios, which means the righteousness, dikaios, of God, theos. And the, the whole theodicy argument is if God is sovereign and there is suffering, then he cannot be loving. If God is loving and there is suffering, and evil, that he cannot be sovereign. And the whole theodicy argument says no. According to Scripture, God is sovereign. 
He is loving, and there is suffering. There is evil in the world. So you have this, uh, this challenge from, the, from Satan in Job 1.10. Have you not put a hedge around him? And his house and all that he has on every side, you've blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased in the land. And that's when God allows him to remove them. So as it begins to unfold, Job comes to the point in Job 121 when he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. In other words, I brought nothing with me into the world. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then again in Job 2, 10, he said to his wife, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And so early on in the book, he's, he's manifesting how he's blameless, he's upright. It's the question... Uh, that we have to ask ourselves when life presses in, shall we receive good from the Lord and not evil, not, the, not difficulty? And so there's a dilemma. And in these debates, uh, his friends come, sit with him, mourn with him, grieve with him, at least they do come. And then they begin to reach wrong conclusions. And it's amazing to me, let me say, I don't know if you've encountered this, when tragedy occurs... Uh, whether it happens in your family or to a friend, it's amazing to me how people rush to get God off the hook. And they say things like, well, God didn't have anything to do with that. Well, see, that may make somebody feel better initially that God was, quote, not involved in that tragedy. But when you begin to reflect upon that, you have to ask the question, what else is God not want to happen? What else, what else happens apparently beyond his control, whether it's self-imposed or whether it's just part of his nature? There's no comfort in that finally. If we live in a universe that's careening out of control and God is not in a position to rule and overrule every, as, as Jerry Bridges said, uh, every atom of everything in life. And so you have these friends who are basically, they, they would tell you they're defending God. A lot of people do that, by the way, when they reject uh, the, the truths of God's sovereignty. They really imagine they are defending the integrity of God from people who are trying to make folks look like robots and automatons. But they're not doing God any favors. Because a God who is not absolutely sovereign is a God who's left us in a real dilemma. So the friends come at it, uh, well-meaning, well-intended, but wrong conclusions. And so Job breaks in at some point and says, no, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. Well, he was, he was innocent in the sense of that he had not done something to set this in motion. But what you discover toward the end of the book when God breaks in Remember, he spoke to Satan, but God has not said a thing. There's not a word from God after he sends Satan out of his presence. Not a word until he breaks in toward the end of the book. So Job begins to develop these notions of how God's going to answer me. He owes me an answer. I, and when God breaks in, everything changes. It's one thing to... Uh, Go hypothetical about God and what we would say to God and how we think God ought to do this, that, and the other. But when, when one encounters the living God, humility, repentance. Isaiah saw it in Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up. And as the glory of God filled the temple symbolically there, in that vision that Isaiah had, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When you have a real glimpse of the glory of God, arrogance and pride is not the response. 
It is always repentance and humility. And so in this, in this section here, Job makes three basic complaints about, about what he's experiencing in, and in the face particularly of what his friends are giving him counsel about. First of all is that God does not hear me. God doesn't hear me. Look at Job 13.3. I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to argue my case with God. And what he's saying here is I, I'd like to take it up, but I don't get the sense that he's listening. Then again in chapter 13, verse 24, why do you hide your face and count me as your enemy? This is, this is Job processing what's going on. He's, that I, I must, you must be set against me. You're hiding your face from me. I don't have a sense of, of you drawing near, having an interest. Job 19, 7. Behold, I cry out violence, but I'm not answered. I, I call for help, but there's no justice. And then Job 23, 3 to 5. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would lay my case before him, fill my mouth with arguments. I would know what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. And you see the progression throughout this, how he just gets more and more agitated, <clears throat> more and more emboldened with what he's going to say to God. And then Job 30, 20, I cry to you for help, and you do not answer me. I stand, and you only look at me. So this notion that God is, is not, he doesn't hear me. The second thing is that God is punishing me. This is a, a complaint that he makes in Job 6, 4. For the arrows of the Almighty are in me. <clears throat> so notice thinking now. It's not simply the passive ignoring of him on God's part where he's not hearing. Now it's the active uh, engagement of God. The arrows of the Almighty are in me. My spirit drinks their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. Job 7.20, if I sin, what do I do to you, you watcher of mankind? Why have you made me your mark? Why have I become a burden? Do you know the words? How, how has my, I haven't sinned to go after you. Job 9, 17. He crushes me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. So you have this, this sense that he's being punished by God. Let me say parenthetically. The doctrine of justification by faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone is, is a absolute necessary. Martin Luther called it the standing or falling article of the church. Without, without a clear understanding of that as a church, a church crumbles. But as individuals, we will too. Because you see, justification by faith means that God has pardoned us for us and he's forgiven us of our sin and accepted us as righteous in his sight completely where he does not count our sin against us anymore. Any relationship he has with us that, that appears to be corrective or disciplinary is as a father correcting children. It's not as a judge meeting out punishment. And so watch yourselves. And you'll hear people say, well, I guess I'm just being punished. You say, well, are you, a, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Yes. You think God's punishing you? Yeah, for my past. or No. Christ died for your past. He took that punishment for you. No, not for your present either. So we've got to, we've got to remember this. And, and, and you see here that Job is not clinging to this kind of an idea at this point. And then third, God allows the wicked to prosper. Here's, his, here's where he's, he's seen his, his whole life go up in flames. Job 21, 7. Why do the wicked live, reach old age, and grow mighty in power? David asked the same thing, by the way, over and over. Why do the heathen prosper? Psalm 2 is, is, is David's perplexity about how people uh, who are the heathen grow uh, and seem to have everything in life, and they, totally, they intentionally outright reject God. Let us, let us break his bands asunder. Let us cast off his yoke. We're not going to have this one to rule over us. David struggles with that as well. This is Job's struggle, his three complaints in the midst of these, uh, these debates. One writer said this, said, his defenses are much stronger, much, much longer than his friend's accusations. And in the process of defending his innocence, I thought this was interesting. In the process of defending his innocence, he becomes guilty of self-righteousness. There's a five-chapter monologue I would encourage you to read at some points, chapters 27 to 31, where Job just goes on and on. And then this is when Elihu, 
uh, steps in and gives his, his take on the matter, which is decidedly different. So I want us to see the friends. Let's just compare the friends right now. Uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Elihu. When you think about uh, uh, something that would characterize, and that's hard to see. I was trying to get everything on a page, a couple of pages. So I'm going to tell you what that says there. When you think about the, uh, the characteristic of them, uh, Eliphaz, is a, he comes across as something of a theologian. Uh, he's bringing uh, arguments about the being of God to bear. Uh, Bildad, however, comes across more as a, as a lawyer, a historian, or a legalist, uh, arguing about the, the, the idea of, of justice and law. Zophar comes, comes across as a moralist uh, with these dogmatic statements. And then Elihu, uh, he comes across sort of as a young theologian, a someone who's more thoughtful about, about God than, than Eliphaz is. When you consider what do they rely on for their arguments, well, uh, Eliphaz seems to rely on his observation and his experience. And by the way, that is, that is such a, a part and parcel of so many people today. In my experience, well, what I've seen, well, look, there's nothing wrong with that. But you have to submit that. That has to be subdued to the revelation of God, the Word of God, to check it. Uh, Bildad relies on, as you would expect a historian, a legalist, he relies on tradition. Well, what we've always thought about this, what we've always been taught, Zophar uh, assumes a lot. He just makes some assumptions without any, any evidence. Uh, Elihu seems to, to rely on a, an educated, thoughtful uh, look at things. One person said, when you look at the personality of these guys, how they, how they come across in their arguments, uh, Eliphaz is considerate. He's a, he's a man of, uh, of some religious background. Bildad seems to be argumentative. He pushes the, the matter. Zophar is rude. Uh, Elihu, though, uh, represents a perception. But really, when you, what you have in here a, a sort of a young, uh, Elihu is sort of a young Eliphaz with more, with more insight. What about uh, when, you, when you hear in them what they're saying? What, what seems to be the influence where they get their voice for this? Well, for Eliphaz, it'd be philosophy. For Bildad, uh, it would be uh, history. For uh, Zophar, and this is interesting, I think, Zophar represents uh, appeals to orthodoxy. He would be, by the way, a modern day, something like a modern day fundamentalist with a capital F. Okay? Uh, just quit your sinning. Just quit doing this. Quit doing that. Uh, that's, the, that's the mentality you have here. And then uh, Elihu uses logic, pretty good reasoning, in his capacity. The argument they make is very interesting, I think. You have, uh, you have Eliphaz who basically says, if you sin, you suffer. If you sin, you suffer. There's the if-then equation. Uh, Bildad says, you must be sinning. Zophar says, you are sinning. Elihu says, God purifies and instructs us through suffering. What, what advice do they give? Eliphaz says, only the wicked suffer. Bildad says, the wicked always suffer. Zophar says the wicked are short-lived. They're going to pay. They're going to pay a great price. And then uh, Elihu says, "Humble yourself and submit to God." And then you want, might want to jot down the key verses in this to look this up later on for uh, for Eliphaz chapter four verse eight, chapter five verse seventeen, for Bildad chapter eight verse eight, uh, for Zophar chapter twenty verse five, and. And uh, Elihu chapter 37, verse 23. What do we see in there of their concept of God? What do they, what do they tell us about, about how they think about God? Well, Eliphaz, God is righteous. He punishes the wicked and blesses the good. Uh, by the way, that is, that is still today a, a prominent perspective in Judaism. Uh, but it's also a prominent perspective 
in American watered-down evangelicalism. You do good, God will bless you. You don't do good, God's going to hurt you. Bill Dad sees God as a judge. Again, not surprisingly, he, when, when you see something sort of a legal background here, he's a judge. He's an immovable lawgiver. The law is what the law is. Zophar, the fundamentalist, portrays God as unbending and merciless. He would make a great Muslim. Elihu his concept of God seems to be that, he, that he, he does discipline his own, but he teaches in that, very much like what we read in Hebrews later on. Well, what does their name mean? I thought this was interesting. Eliphaz means, uh, there's some shading in the Hebrew here. God is, not the Hebrew, the Canaanite. God is gold or God dispenses the meaning of his name. So judgment, the idea of judgment. Bildad, his name means son of contention. So far, his name means rough. Another rendering of it I found is chirper. I don't know what that has to do with it, but, but the idea of being rough. Elihu's name means he is my God. And so this is, these are the friends... Three who come in and one who comes in late who bring their counsel to bear. And as, and as much as we would admire what uh, Elihu was saying, he still has not gotten it completely right. And so the, so the book ends <clears throat> in this deliverance of Job. I want us to uh, look real quickly, if you would. I don't have this on the screen, but I want to read for you Job 38. It's right after Elihu has said some wonderful things about, <clears throat> about the majesty of God, responding to Job's uh, assertion that he's going to get some answers from God. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, God's been quiet this whole time. You haven't heard a word from God the whole book after the encounter with Satan. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Piper's, uh, Piper's description when he's talking about this says that, that this dark cloud would appear and then bad things would happen in the early, early stage of the book. And so Piper talks about how this, this cloud then becomes active. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens my counsel by words without knowledge? Now it's interesting because this comes in the aftermath, in the conclusion of Elihu's statements about the majesty of God. Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Who shut, up, shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment in thick darkness? Did you get this? There's just this uh, thundering. And it goes on. And on. And then Job responds. Look at chapter 40. The Lord's continuing. The Lord says to Job, Shall, I, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. <clears throat> 
Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. Notice the difference in what you say you're going to do. I'm going to talk to you. And what happens when you encounter God? What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. In other words, I'm, I'm going to shut up now. I've spoken once. I will not answer. Twice, but I will proceed no further. Notice what the Lord says. Verse 7. Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abasing. And boy, <clears throat> so basically God's saying, no. I want to ask you. I'm going to challenge you to answer. And so you have that uh, that chapter 40, verses 3 to 5, where Job realizes that he has sinned. Notice the movement here. I'm innocent. I don't know why this has happened to me. In a, in a great moment, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I know that my Redeemer lives, and it's... That he will stand in the last day, those great things that Job says, which give us such, such an encouragement and affirmation in the face of great suffering. But he loses his way. I'm going to ask God. God's going to answer me. And then when God begins to speak, Job doesn't appeal to his innocence anymore. He doesn't appeal to God's wrongdoing. He appeals to his own sin. For not in something he did to set this in motion, but his sin against the goodness of God. To measure God's goodness by what's happening around us. To measure God's goodness by what we're getting from him. So in Job 42, 1 to 6, notice how the tone has completely changed. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you. And you make it known to me. This is God. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Why? How do you make a statement like that? For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And God has taught here about all these the activities of the animals, his, creation, his creative activity. Saying basically to Job, you don't understand any of that. These are not the explanations you would have given about the animal kingdom that I created. How then will you understand spiritual things? It reminds me of Jesus with Nicodemus. I've talked to you about earthly things. How, if you don't understand these, how are you going to understand spiritual things? It's interesting in God's breaking in on Job, because you really can't call this God's response to Job's questions. In God's breaking in on Job, he makes no reference to his sufferings and hardly touches on the real issue of the debate. But in this encounter 
Job catches a glimpse of the divine perspective of how God sees things. And brothers and sisters, that's where we've got, we need to get there. How does God view things? When he acknowledges God's sovereignty over his life, we know in the end that God then begins to restore. Again, I don't believe it's because, because Job finally got it right. I think God restores to show his sovereign prerogative that as surely as he gave and took away, he can give again. Look at what James 5 said. And I think this is where people get this notion of the patience of Job. James 5, 11, Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. And that's the, if you're going to use a word, the, the, the steadfastness of Job, he does not finally give up on God. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. There's a sense in which had Job not gone through this, he could have simply given that glib, well, look, hadn't God blessed me? You find out if you really believe God blessed you when it's taken away. And then James 1, 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Well, okay, so that's, kind of, that's, the, that's the picture of the book. Um, the title is, is the, the name Yov. And Yov, uh, that's the Hebrew title. What we're not sure is that originally was it identified as this in the Hebrew or was there a, uh, an, another identification in the Arabic. But, but in the Hebrew, uh, it can mean persecuted one. But there's also uh, another perspective. And that is, go to the next one if you would. The next slide. There's another meaning from the Arabic, which means to come back or to repent. So, could be repentant one. And it's just one of those things you have to just let it to let it, <clears throat> excuse me, let it stand. I said earlier that some folks have talked about the, uh, uh, the authorship. Here are the suggestions as to who wrote it. Job, Elihu, Moses, Solomon, Isaiah, Hezekiah, Jeremiah, Baruch, and Ezra. Basically everybody but you and me, all right? And put up as a possible author. It's because we just don't know. That's, that's not the emphasis of the book. The emphasis of the book is to show that from olden times, the sovereignty of God is a watershed and that the only way to embrace and come through suffering is to recognize that God is sovereign in it. The date uh, and setting is another, another challenge we have. Um, could be 2000, around 2000 B.C., the time of the patriarchs. There's just so much we're uncertain of in this, in this book that we need to just spend our emphasis on, on what we are certain of. We, we know, for example, from Job 42.16 that after this event, Job lived 140 years. Uh, he saw his sons and his sons' sons, four generations, after the book was completed. When you hear that kind of, they lived 140 years, you're talking about uh, typically pre-Diluvian, before the flood uh, existence. Uh, Abraham, for example, was 175 years old. <clears throat> How, trying to date it, Job's wealth, as it's listed here, is measured not in coin, but in livestock. And, the, and measuring wealth in livestock is another ancient uh, way to, to see life. He prays for his family. He functions as something of a priest. It's, it's, it's almost like it predates the notion of, of, uh, of a community, Jewish community. Throughout the book, there's no reference to Israel, to the Exodus, to the Mosaic Law, or to the Tabernacle. 
the Chaldeans who, uh, who are the murderers, who murder his, his servants, uh, are nomads. They're not city dwellers, whereas they are city dwellers later on in Bible history. And I told you earlier, he uses the term for God, Shaddai, 31 times. Uh, it's found only 17 times in the rest of the Old Testament. And it speaks of, of the Almighty, the, the idea of the captain uh, of armies. So I won't plow through all the different theories about the, uh, about the, the date of it, simply to say that it's just hard to peg down. It's one of the oldest books uh, in the Old Testament because of the very things I just cited to you, where things are developed when it was written. Uh, but the theme and the purpose of it. Let's talk about that. Uh, the theme is God's sovereignty. We're going to see that in a key word in a minute. But it's to show that God is sovereign over all things, that suffering occurs within the pale of his sovereignty. It doesn't happen outside of it. That's got to be something you're committed to. Because uh, if you're not, you won't, you, you'll be like the three friends. You won't give good counsel to people who are going through suffering. Now, you, we don't want to do the glib like I, years ago, I remember, not too long after I got here. I was involved in a situation where there was this tragic death in the family of one of our members. So I went south of here to go to the uh, funeral home to comfort the family, to represent us to them. And one of our members was there and was talking and sharing with me the conversation they'd had with this family. The family, the little boy, was a tragedy where the little boy was accidentally hanged in a tree while playing and he, he died. They looked out the window in the backyard and there he was, dead. And so the grieving mom was saying to this family member who was a member, he said, but I, I know he's in heaven. I know he's in heaven. And this person was telling me their response. Their response was, well, if he was one of the elect, he's in heaven. Brothers and sisters, that's not how you minister to grieving people. So stay out of the ditches. The ditch of this, of this fatalistic determinism and the ditch of this, look, trying to get God off the hook. God doesn't need to be gotten off the hook. He's big enough to handle himself. All we need to do is speak what God speaks, declare what he declares. And the truth of a mo for a mom in that situation is that God is on the throne. This did not catch him by surprise. And he is able to rule and overrule this and bring comfort to you for his glory for your good and for the sake of Christ and the gospel. It's never wise to debate posthumously the spiritual condition of someone who was killed in tragedy. It's always good to bring the gospel to bear on those who remain and are alive. God's sovereignty over suffering will help you through this. That's its theme. And the purpose was to show, uh, to show Job that the God who had blessed him with everything is able to take it all away and still be God and is able to give it all back and still be God. And one of the great moments in the book is the Lord gave, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The keys to Job, of course, the word, key word I would go for is sovereignty. Uh, the verses we read earlier, uh, though he slay me, I will hope in him. And then the key chapter is chapter 42. You need to get to chapter 42. It's good to read the whole book, but you need to get to chapter 42 and see how God brings it all together on his terms. Remember, he, he, he's, by the way, brother, and sister, he's under no obligation to answer you or me. Now, I want to be sure you understand that it's okay to ask why. God did not chide Job for asking why. He commended him for getting beyond that. You see, every, every trial in our lives will typically evoke a, what I call a spontaneous why. Don't do like some people do where they say, well, we're just, uh, we just can't question God. They, they've read Job wrongly if they think that this is teaching you can't question God. 
If Moses had not questioned God and pled with God, think about this. When he was told by God, you're not taking them into the promised land. You will not see the promised land. If he had not pressed God about that so that God took him up on Mount Pisgah where he could see over into the promised land, he'd never seen it in this life. So don't fall into that trap. These two things you want to, two ditches you want to avoid. Don't fall into the trap that says, well, we can't question God. You can question God, but you don't want to, you don't want to begin and end with why. And then, and then sulk and mope and, and go bury yourself in a hole because God doesn't necessarily answer why. You want to start there, but you want to move to what? Saul of Tarsus was on the road to Damascus. Who are you, Lord? Now, that's, that's another way of saying, why is this happening to me? He didn't stay there, though. What would you have me to do? What would you have me to do? What would you have me to learn? How should I live in the light? It's okay to start with why. I think it's a, it's a gut response to difficulty, to tragedy, to unhappy providences. But don't live there. Don't stop there. Move beyond and experience what Job experiences in the end. A humbling if we need to be humbled. A comforting if we need to be comforted. A confidence, a renewed confidence in a dimension we didn't have before in the sovereignty of God over all of this. What about Jesus Christ in Job? It's interesting that he acknowledges him, uh, the need of a redeemer. Look at this. Job 19, 25 to 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives. That's, a, that's an amazing concept for when this was written. I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. After my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Job, why is this happening? I don't know, but I know this. I know that my Redeemer lives. He cries out for a mediator. Look at Job 9.33. There's no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on us both. We, I, need, I need a mediator. Chapter 25, verse 4. How then can man be in the right before God? How can he who is born of woman be pure? He realizes God's so, so other than me. Job 33, 23, if there be for him an angel, a mediator, one of a thousand, to declare to man what is right for him. Job recognizes a redeemer and a mediator. The book raises questions that are only answered in Christ. When you're asking, how can I suffer? How can these people suffer? How can this? We remember that Jesus Christ suffered. All the suffering you know that goes on is, is, is attached to sin in one way, shape, or form. Jesus Christ never sinned, and yet he suffered at the hands of sinners. So Hebrews 4.15 says, we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. I was watching Brother Norman teach in a Q&A uh, when they were asking him in Haiti this past week about uh, temptation versus sin, you know. You handled it very well, by the way. I, I, was, I appreciate it. It was, it was tricky. Uh, Martin Luther said about that, he said, you know, the difference between temptation and sin is you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. That's temptation, flying over your head. Sin, building a nest in your hair. But here we have it right here. Jesus was tempted. When you struggle with temptation, don't, don't dwell on it, don't live there, don't give in to it. Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet he did not sin. And there is a clear distinction between temptation to sin and sin. So we have these answers in Jesus Christ. Christ is the believer's life, redeemer, mediator, and advocate. And Job is grasping at that, acknowledging these things and grasping at that in this book. He has hope because a Redeemer will live. Well, as far as his contribution, getting ready to close here, um, 
one writer said this, and, and he would know this from, from his knowledge of Hebrew, that it's a book of dramatic poetry that is unsurpassed in beauty, depth, and intensity. And you might, you and I might not pick that up in English, but it's, but it's there in, in Hebrew. He makes rich use of syn- synonymous, antithetic, and synthetic parallelism. We talked about that last week, um, a couple weeks ago, when we looked at the, an overview to the books of poetry, looked at these various uh, tools. In his setting, Job offers a glimpse of non-Hebrew culture during the times of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. It's a book that you could use to witness to non-Christians, people who are not believers. And then one writer pointed this out, and I thought this was, was good here, that Job reveals five ways in which God uses hardships that are reflected in Deuteronomy 8. What we're going to do is compare what's happening in Job with some teaching and a few verses in Deuteronomy 8. God uses this to humble us. Look at Job 22, 29. For when they are humbled, you say, it is because of pride, but he saves the lowly. Deuteronomy 8, 2 said, You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Difficulties. Humble us. Secondly, to test us. Job 2, 3. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth, a blameless, upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Deuteronomy 8, 2. You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years that he might humble you, testing you. And there's the emphasis at that point, testing you. Three, to rearrange our priorities. Do you think Job's priorities were rearranged when all this happened? I promise you. Everything changed in his world. Job 42, 5 and 6. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Notice the difference. I knew about you. Now I know you. Johnny Erickson Tata. She was Johnny Erickson, a swimmer with Olympic dreams. When she dived into a pool that was not as deep as she thought it was, hit her head at the bottom of the pool, severed her spinal cord, was in a wheelchair ever since, and still today ministers remarkably. She said, because it was during the aftermath of that, when she came to know Jesus Christ, I would rather be sitting in this wheelchair knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior than able-bodied without him. It rearranges priorities. Deuteronomy 8.3. He humbled you to let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Andre Crouch, son of a, of a, of a black Baptist preacher, uh, sang some, some songs in the 70s and 80s. And he had one song that said, how would, if, we, if we never had any problems, how would we know that God could solve them? Fourth, to discipline us. Job 5, 17. Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. That's an amazing concept that you see come full bore in Hebrews. And it talked about how the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. Deuteronomy 8, 5. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. And then fifth, to prepare us for future blessings. Job 42, 10. The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Out of Deuteronomy 8, 7. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing out of the valleys and the hills. The Puritans used to say in a a book that's on, on Puritans as pastors, they would teach their people that when difficulty comes, to embrace it because they said oftentimes before the Lord will hoist a larger sail to catch the wind of the Spirit, he must enlarge the bow of the boat Otherwise, the boat tips over, and this he does 
through difficult providences, through suffering. That's how they understood the Bible's teaching on suffering. The only way you'll keep your sanity as life presses in, and for some, it is pressing in at a, at a greater rate with a greater intensity. The only way you keep your sanity is to believe that in a way that escapes your capacity to understand, God is sovereign in this too. My friend James Brady, who died recently, posted uh, a song of, that was one of his favorites by... Help me, Joshua. Sovereign over us. It'll come to you in a minute. You know him. He's, he's done some great, some great songs over the couple of decades now. Huh? Stephen Curtis Chapman. Thank you. Sovereign over us. This was James's favorite song. Even what the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good and for your glory. And it was one that his family sang around him as he was dying. It was one that was sung at his funeral. Now, finally, Job gives us the most intensive survey of creation in the Bible. Go back and read the sections where God begins to press Job. He has more to say about creation than we have in the creation account. He teaches that the earth is suspended in empty space. Look at Job 26, 7. He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. Suspended in space. He implies that the earth is a sphere in Job 22, 14. Thick clouds veil him so that he does not see and he walks on the vault of heaven. This picture of a sphere. That's the book of Job. It's a fascinating Job book. It's about a steadfast man who loses his way but doesn't lose his heart for God. It's a clear picture of the sovereignty of God. Quickly now, theodicy. How can God be sovereign, loving, loving slash good, and there be evil in the world? Well, other questions are asked. Couldn't God have made a man and woman who would not sin? If he had done that, if Adam and Eve had come into the world and not sinned and kept his commandment through whatever the, whatever the probation period was, then you and I, as their progeny, would not have been worshiping the Son of God we would have been worshiping our first parents who, who earned life for us. And to worship someone made, created, is a violation of the moral law of God, that you shall have no other gods before me. You see, it was necessary that our first parents sin to set into motion God's plan to redeem. And Everything we suffer in this life is a result of sin in some way, shape, or form. Disease, because we live in a fallen world with decaying bodies susceptible to disease. Since the canopy came down after the flood, we've all been susceptible to that. Other people harming us, wronging us political system that is unfair. All of the suffering, all the difficulty that we face is a result of sin. And every bit of it is designed to remind us. And this is what I pray. Dear God, help me remember. Number one, I need a Savior. Suffering for sin is to be a constant reminder. I need a Savior every day. Number two, this world is not my home. It's not my home. I was made for a much better place than this. So God is sovereign. He is loving. 
and there is evil. And because he is sovereign and loving, we can face evil. We can face suffering. Knowing that there's a much better place, a land, fairer than day. Where there's no sin, no sorrow, no sadness, no sickness. Apart from that, folks, suffering makes no sense and will drive a person to utter despair. Take a couple of questions while Michelle cues up this song I want to play for you before we leave. Any questions?